This is Greg Pass with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is June the 5th, 2015, and I'm conducting an interview with John, John Dychek. We are at the Mid-Atlantic Air Museum in Pennsylvania for the World War II weekend. Sir, would you please give us your full name, your date of birth, and where you were born? Hi, I'm John Dychek. I was born in uh, New York City, New York, and my birthday is uh, 3 one And what um, military uh, operation did you participate in? I'm a Navy helicopter pilot. I was flying RH-53Ds, and I participated in Operation Eagle Claw, Task Force 179 at the time, and that was an attempt to rescue the American hostages held in Tehran. Okay, so we'll get back up just a little bit and talk about your um, your military, especially your training that went into it before for the um, the operation. So you were you're a pilot. Well. The way this happened initially is that we were on deployment up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and our m mission was to be self-deployed anywhere in the world in 24 hours, and they would take partially apart the helicopter, take some of the rotor blades off the tail rotor blades, lower the nose wheel, lower the transmission, and they would fit two of them in a C-5A galaxy. And we had just uh, returned from Halifax, Nova Scotia on a minesweeping deployment. We were up there, and that was on a Thursday and the commanding officer, Van Goodloe, said, hey guys, you know, you've been working hard, don't come back till Monday. So Monday morning we came back and everything happens. Your enlisted guys, their wives walked out on them, they have problems, everybody's got problems, so you're trying to solve those problems. And I went to work out for lunch, and when I came back from lunch, the proverbial poop had hit the fan. People are running around like chickens without their heads on, and they said, we're going to Guam, we're going to Guam. Operation Rice Bowl, we're going to Guam. And Nobody knew what was going on, and a friend of mine who is a little senior to me got to go, and I'm thinking, oh man, he did it again, because he was always senior to me, he was a Naval Academy guy, I was an officer candidate. And the next morning, we come in, and they were looking for eight pilots for air to air refueling training, and we were gonna go to Cherry Point, North Carolina. And we were all dressed up in our spanking new flight suits because we came back from deployment from Canada, our brand new blue turtlenecks and our American flag patches, our HM-16 patches, HM-16 ball caps. And we fly our helicopter, which had a brand new paint job on it, it was Delta Hotel 27, was a call sign of it. And we go to Cherry Point, North Carolina. And I had not been to many Marine bases, but as we landed there, we got out of the helicopter, there was two beautifully painted staff cars. And these young Marines in there, Class A uniforms, you know, sir, officers stay with us, enlisted stay with the aircraft, sir. And we're thinking, what is going on here? So we go to the administration building, which we call the Puzzle Palace, big white building and, uh, where the headquarters is on Cherry Point, and standing outside the door are two guards with M16s in their camis. But again, not being a Marine base, we're thinking, this is normal. As I walk in, I see one of my buds from flight school there, Jim Lenderman, and he's inside the classroom. Go, hey, Jim, how you doing? And he shakes me off. And I look inside the door, and there's two guards in there with M16s. And we're going, like, what is going on here? So we go ahead, and we go into the general's office, and this stocky colonel, Colonel Pittman, Chuck Pittman, ribbons from here to here, turns to the general, and he goes, General, would you please see these men have enough coffee and donuts? And we're, like, taken aside, like, what is going on here? We have never heard a colonel talk like that to a general. And we're in there eating these donuts, trying to drink our coffee because we don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden we hear this beep, 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 beep. And the aide comes out and he goes, uh, gentlemen, you need to leave this office. We have a call on the red phone. And we're going, the red phone? <laughs> that only exists in the movies. So we all go out and they kept Commander Goodlow and he had been in Tehran or in, in Iran at Bandar Abbas as an exchange tour because they had RH-53s also for mine sweeping. And when they came in, Goodlow was white as a ghost, and they come into the outer office and they go, gentlemen, here's what we're doing. You've heard that the American hostages are taken, and we're putting together a, a mix of Navy pilots, because you know the RH-53D, and Marine pilots who know the tactical mission, and we're gonna put you guys together and train, and we're gonna rescue these people. And, I mean, it was just, when you join the military, you think about dying all the time, but this, this was for real. And it's like, you know, tears came to your eyes. You're thinking, oh, God, what have I got myself into? And we trained in a place in North Carolina that doesn't exist. And we did takeoffs and landings that night. We were using night vision goggles. And at that time, if you're within a mile of each other, you're close enough. I mean, that's as far as we got. Eventually, we got so we can overlap rotor blades and 
you'd watch his plume of his exhaust on the night vision goggles get bigger and you knew you had to add power and that's how, how we started flying. Before you go any further, tell the audience whoever's watching this what kind of aircraft it is and describe it to somebody who's not familiar the, with it. The, well, the way the mission initially was going to go is they wanted to fly H-47 helicopters from a NATO base over Turkey into Iran. But because it was a Muslim country, they didn't want to do that because of possible repercussions. The H-47 is too tall to fit on the carrier deck of a helicopter, so that was out of the, the play there. The Marine Corps helicopters at the time did not have auxiliary fuel tanks on the sides of them, which gave us the capability to fly seven and a half hours without refueling, whereas the Marines can only fly about two and a half, three hours with theirs. And that's why they went to the RH-53s. And we had refueling probes on them, and that wasn't really a player at the time because the aircraft that could refuel helicopters were not themselves air refuelable. And Saudi Arabia wouldn't let us fly over their country because of the chance of repercussions, so they had to fly from Wadakina Cairo West all the way around Saudi Arabia, they had to do like five refuelings to get the C-130s in there. And that's what happened. So that's why they chose the RH-53D. It's a 42,000 pound gross helicopter. We were wavered up to 48,000 pounds. Uh, they went ahead and took off anything that was superfluous for weight. The engine air particle separators, you've heard about those. That's just for long-term blade erosion from sand. But short term, you can leave them off, and it actually gives you some horsepower, and it it gives you weight of the uh, EAPS, the engine air particle separators, the big barrels on the front of the engines that you see. They took the heaters out, they took the windows out, anything that was excess weight, they took them out. So we had the external fuel tanks, 650 gallons each side, the internal fuels, and we had two smaller tanks inside, which gave us a, a capability of eight hours of fuel on the aircraft. And the, the crew for something like this? What, what we did is we had a, a aircraft commander. Bill Hoff was an uh, ex-presidential pilot. He was my aircraft commander. I was his uh, pilot on the other side. We had a crew chief and two gunners. It was supposed to be, quote, a sterile strategic uh, extract. But as soon as we left the ship, they put the 50s in the doors just in case we needed them, 50 caliber machine guns. And, and um, anybody else on board this aircraft? No, that was it. All right, so I'm sorry, go, go on. So, where was I here? So we start training and we're on the East Coast and we're doing these missions, just basically trying to fly night vision goggles. If at that time we would have went, we would have gotten killed because we just weren't that good yet. And at that time, the Delta guys, they were for, out of uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. They were under Charlie Beckwith they were practicing and these guys are great. I mean, these guys could hit what they, they shoot at. They don't make any noise when they shoot. They see in the dark and they can talk to each other without anybody else hearing. These guys are, are good at what they do, they're experts. And one day we went ahead and after a couple faux pas that we had in, in North Carolina, because it was a big learning experience, we go ahead and we fly to Camp Perry and at that time, was, we flew the whole crew up to Camp Perry, and we had to fly the helicopter back to Cherry Point, North Carolina, or to Naval Air Station, Oceana, and drop it off. And they were going to pick us up in a van, myself and Les Petty and our crew chiefs, and fly and drive back up to Camp Perry. Well, we get to the Camp Perry gate, and the guard there is going nuts. He says, you guys are late. You're late. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you. And we drive up to this little short airstrip, and the C-130 has got all four engines turning and burning. The gate's down, and again, Seifert yells at us, you know, where the hell have you guys been? You guys are late. Come on, let's go, let's go. We get up in the C-130, last guy sits down, gate comes up, airplane takes off, gear up, flaps up, and all of a sudden, flaps start coming down, gear comes down, we turn around, we land at Langley Air Force Base, it's just south of there. And we're in the middle of the airfield, we got pallets with 50 caliber machine guns on it, we had a pallet of beer, and a you know, pallet of all, all our other equipment. And at that time, the OOD of Langley Air Force Base, the officer of the day comes out, says, hey, what are you guys doing out here? And we said, don't talk to us. Talk to that little colonel over there. And the colonel basically told him, forget your sauce. We're not here. Just go about your business. And they put us in a C-141, and we take off. Well, we don't know where we're going. We go to talk to the crew chiefs on the 141, and they say, sir, please don't talk to us. We're not allowed to talk to you guys. <laughs> So, so we're flying in this 141. Next thing we, we know, after hours and hours of flying, we don't know it, but we're going to Laguna Army Proving Ground. 
uh, Yuma Proving Ground, which is Laguna Army Airfield. Now, at that time, the paved lit runway was 5,000 feet long. The other runway was 6,000 feet long. In the in-route supplement, which tells you how long the runways are, it actually had the paved lit runway was a 6,000 foot runway. So as we start making our approach, the flaps come down, the gears come down, we start seeing orange trees and desert, and still don't know where we're going. And it was the most positive, affirmative landing we have ever had, full reverse, airplane, nose wheel was off the end of the runway when he got there. That's how hard he had to stop. And what it was is, he thought it was a 6,000 foot runway, and he wasn't qualified to land on a shorter runway, and the colonel said, land now. And they put us down, and we got out, and we still don't know where we're at, but we see a hangar there with these very odd, odd-looking aircraft. And there's two helicopters there, and what happened is, the AH-64 had not been completed yet, but the Hellfire missile system had. So they had Hellfire missile systems on a Cobra helicopter. And we're thinking, like, where in the world are we? We've never seen anything. So the next day, we find out where we're at. So now, at that time, we, were, we weren't shaving, looking grungy. We took off all our patches. They told us to put our patches back on, and we were going to do a blue-green mix, an Army or a uh, Marine Corps and a Navy mix. That was our cover story. And from there, we started flying these six-hour missions. We'd land somewhere. Next night, fly another six hours just to practice navigating. And our primary means of navigation was the Mark 1 Mod 0 eyeball and a map. You know, time, distance, heading is the way we were flying. Eventually they came out with a PINS, which is a palletized inertial navigation system, which is on the KC-135s, and they actually transported them to Oman, I think it was, started them up and spooled them up there, put them on a C-2 Greyhound, flew them aboard the carrier, and then put them up on the, the helicopters, but they weren't accurate. So you really couldn't use them for navigation the way we did, because we were low-level nav, 500 feet and blow all the way in. <coughs> Several times, when they threatened to kill the hostages, our priorities would get better, and we'd have to go to uh, San Diego to get parts for the helicopters, or out to Tustin, Marine Corps Air Station, Tustin, to get parts. But when they stopped talking about killing the hostages, we'd sort of go into low-key mode, and we weren't flying a lot. Uh, nighttime usually begins when it gets dark, when we were flying with the, AC, with the AC-130s or the MC-130s that were coming in from Herbert Field, they had to get crew rest. So these guys would wake up in the morning and fly out there, and they had to get their crew rest. So we were taking off at 2 o'clock in the morning and flying at night, and we almost flew into the ground a couple times. Guys were falling asleep in helicopters. We said, okay, if you're going to do this, you guys are going to come in the day before, and then we're going to do this. And we started practicing these missions. And we, like I said, we got very good at it. We did some practice air to air refueling which wasn't a problem. They uh, practiced some blivet drops, which are these huge rubber tanks that they would drop under the parachute. And I had to clean up the mess from a blivet drop one night. They tried that, the C-130 flew over, but the gates that hold the blivets in weren't set properly, so all the blivets came out of the helicopter, or the C-130 at one time. And they said they could hear, just hear the parachutes going in the air, and he's, you know, they sort of dove for cover, and these things hit the ground. And when I went out there the next morning to recover all this debris, there was holes, you know, six, eight feet in diameter, two feet deep, just full of fuel out in the middle of the desert, it looked like craters. And we had to pick up that, so they decided that wasn't going to work. So the way they were going to refuel us is they were going to fly the C-130s in to Desert One, and they had these giant bladders, almost water beds of fuel in each of the C-130s, and a little gasoline pump that would fire, you know, they would fire that up, and that would pump the fuel into the helicopters, and from Desert One we would take off and go to the hide, and from the hide we'd each do our mission. So one day they said, hey, we're going, and sure enough, they got us out to um, Marine Corps Air Station, Yuma, and they put us in a 141, and we went to Travis Air Force Base. We spent the night at Travis. From Travis, we went to Hickam in Hawaii, spent a couple hours there. Les Petty bought a pink T-shirt. Everybody bought a bottle of booze. And from there we flew to Guam, and from Guam we flew to the Philippines, and we showered up there. From Guam we went to Diego Garcia, and we got to Diego Garcia, that's where my squad, half my squadron was on De Diego Garcia. And two of the guys that had worked for me were there. And he goes, hey, Mr. Dychik, how are you doing? And I said, hey, how are you? We're just doing a blue-green mix, you know, just not saying anything. And Larry Cook, who's passed away since then, he goes, you know, John Boy, you're not supposed to be talking to anybody. My nickname was John Boy. And they go ahead and they give this poor kid, he had his uh, over-the-calf socks on, shorts, and a white t-shirt, and they said, 
you know, Airmen, we want you to take this box, don't open it, give it to Commander Goodlow on the Nimitz, and don't talk to anybody. And they kidnapped this kid, and they took him with us. And I saw him after the thing, and he swore he'd never talk to me again. <laughs> so, so from there, we go to Oman, and we went ahead and we took an H-46, we get in the H-46, and the pilot says, hey, sir, you know, to Colonel Pittman, uh, we're going to go here. And he goes, no, 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 here's where you're going. And they flew us aboard the Nimitz. We landed on Nimitz. At that time, we were looking grungy, no patches on our flight suits or anything. And my squadron mates are on the Nimitz. And again, we were told not to talk to those guys. Uh, as a helicopter pilot, you're usually the lowest on the list on the ship. But it was sort of cool because they threw an S-3 squadron out of their ready room and made it our ready room. We put a Marine guard on there with a gun, and you had to have the super secret password to get in there. Uh, they didn't put us in regular officers' quarters. They actually put us down in the infirmary that we could sleep and get a good night's sleep. Uh, in our training, that was sort of the tough stuff. As our, our day started, we'd get up early, we'd eat breakfast, we'd go ahead and we'd uh, do our maps, and we'd usually go for a three-mile run, run out to the tower and back, and then we'd take a nap from like 1 o'clock till 5 o'clock, and we'd watch Dan Rather on the news, and he was actually one of our remembrance ceremonies. And because the news was actually how we found out most of our intelligence about what was going on, if you remember, you know, day, you know, 200 and something. And we were actually captured for four months. We'd joke around about that. And uh, we'd make our maps. And when you do seven hours of maps, you can't have them in a the cockpit. They're just too big. So we would actually cut strips of maps and we'd have them so they'd fold out like an accordion. And with the time distance heading, and you'd fly this far, and whoever was in the lead would navigate, and everybody else would back them up. And one night, when we were training, we couldn't go high because of icing, because it was precipitation up there in clouds and it was freezing level, and we couldn't go low because of the rocks and the mountains. And all of a sudden, it started raining on us, and we had what we call an in-flight breakup, where we lost sight of each other in the clouds. And we had this breakup, and finally, we turned around, and, is that you, is that you, is that you, is that you, we finally got the airplanes under control, and flash your lights if that's you, and he flashes, you know, his high beams at us, basically, and we, okay, that's us, and Les just happened to have a map of the whole place with him, and you can follow highways at night as long as there's cars on the highways, and I was flying his rotator, the anti-collision light, they call it, and I could have been upside down, I was just locked onto that attitude gyro, just trying to stay straight and level, because it was so, there was no horizon out there, and all I could see his flasher. And as we approach Needles, we hear you know, aircraft over Needles, aircraft over Needles, uh, you know, contact us on this frequency. And it was on the guard frequency, which is an emergency frequency. And all of a sudden, all the lights at Needles Airport lit up. And we're going like, oh God, <laughs> we lived, we survived. And uh, that night we made it back, and you know, had a couple drinks that we needed to soothe ourselves down. So the training was intense. Uh, we did some eight-hour missions. We landed at uh, 29 Palms and lined up the helicopters. That's where we were practicing refueling. And the C-130s were always on time. And when we're looking at our watches, and by God, it's 2.30 in the morning, and where are they? And we see the shooting star go to the end of the runway. Well, it's not a shooting star. It's a C-130's peanut light bulb on his landing gear to show that it's down. It's the only light they forgot to turn off. And we heard this 130 land on this metal mat runway, and we are just running for the edges so we don't get ran over by the C-130. So things like that happened. The C-130 would start pulling ahead, and since we did a tactical shutdown, we didn't use the rotor blade, which, which would lock their rotor head in place. And as he started taxiing, just like a pinwheel, that rotor head starts turning, and people are going to get hurt out there. So you'd have to run into the helicopter, throw in the auxiliary power unit, and from there, we'd go ahead and have to put the rotor brake on to get everything stable so nobody would get hurt. <coughs> so we had a lot of incidents like that. Uh, once we board the carrier, we knew that once they painted the aircraft desert tan, that we were going for real. And they were supposed to shut down the comms on the ship, the communications, and that was it. A uh, funny story is that the uh, bosun's mates on the ship, the um, CMAA, Chief Masters in Arms, are the policemen of the ship. They went ahead and brought a giant duffel bag full of confiscated contraband weapons to give to our enlisted guys. Swords, knives, bayonets, <laughs> these things, everybody had them. Uh, one of our uh, uh, crew chiefs 
he was a little guy, probably not even five foot tall. He brought his own weapon with him. He had a 12 inch barrel, 44 Magnum with him. Thing hung down below his knee. Some guys had nine millimeters, but they gave us 38s and M16s is what we had. And we were taping our magazines together like the Marines told us. I'm a Navy guy, so I didn't know much about that. You know, so we're taping our magazines together and we had practice out shooting out in the desert at flashlights and stuff to just become a little proficient with the weapons. But we went down and <coughs> they started painting an aircraft tan. So we knew we were going. Uh, because all the aircraft looked alike and there was no big numbers on them, they actually put little, maybe two inch high numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, on each of the helicopters so you could tell which aircraft we were in. I was in aircraft number six. One of the stories that you've heard is that uh, Dewey Johnson, who was killed during this mission, uh, Staff Sergeant Johnson, great guy, he, uh, because of the fumes of the paint, they were using polyurethane paint, which was illegal at that time, but they asked for volunteers. Of course, everybody, the whole ship wanted to volunteer. He was looking for a way to open up the hangar doors to get some airflow, and he pulled the wrong handle, and he hit the saltwater washdown system. And some people feel, oh, that messed up the mission. Well, you know, airplanes can fly in the rain, so that didn't really do anything. And the corrosion from the salt water, it was short-term stuff anyway. They would have just, you know, the airplanes were going to be left there anyway. So that was one of the incidents that happened. But uh, when we came up, uh, we actually came up on the elevator in the, in the helicopter. We unfolded the helicopters, you know, the rotor blades unfold, the tail rotor comes around. And they actually pulled the wires up on the aircraft carrier and the aircraft carrier was making 25 knots into the wind or more and we were indicating like 45 knots on our indicated airspeed on the deck and we were, we were heavy we were wearing 46 or 48,000 pounds roughly so we were really heavy and we took off and uh, took off the hell off the aircraft carrier off the Nimitz and we were they were going into the buffer zone which is 25 miles out and just like it was in our briefings there was like a little u-shaped uh, bay there and we flew right over that and 500 feet and below the aircraft really couldn't do the speed that we were intending to do because of the blade tracking and probably the weight had something to do with it but I remember as we passed over the mountains we were uh, the C-130s were supposed to pass us and sure enough there's the 130s going right by us and you could actually hear them even though you had your earplugs in and your helicopter helmets on and they passed us and we go in and we were about two hours in the, the way the mission was is there was eight air, aircraft. There was four aircraft were supposed to go to the stadium. Two were supposed to go to the charge and fair, which is where Bruce Langdon, the ambassador, was. And the other two were backup. So if anybody went down, again, radio silence, you'd signal with a flashlight, and that other aircraft would follow you down, and you would go ahead and he would pick you up. And when you got to the desert hide, you would take that aircraft and do your mission. So we were supposed to go to Bruce Langdon's residents there and pick him up there and the other four helicopters were supposed to go into the soccer stadium with the two backups. About two hours in, the way we had to have the cockpits configured, because night vision goggles just amplify light. And nowadays they have a green light and it's the only spike of green light that night vision goggles don't see. So if you had any light on in the cockpit, the reflection from the windshields was so bad you couldn't see out of the helicopter. So what we did is on our instrument panel, we went ahead and basically turned all the lights off. On our master caution lights, they were yellow. We would go ahead and put a piece of black electrical tape over them with a little pinhole. On our warning lights, like our fire lights, which are red, <coughs> we'd put a tape, same pinhole. And over our master caution panel, which was, I can't remember, I think there were six rows of lights and they're about this big. We actually had a big piece of cardboard over it so that you could look under there and see which one was lit up and we had big baffles that we built so that his lights wouldn't bother me if he was flying. So I was flying on the goggles and the lights light up in the cockpit. And I said, Billy, what's going on? I said, we've got a master caution line. I said, what is it? And he goes, it's BIM channel one. Well, what BIM is, it's a blade indicator method. On the CH-53s that the Marine Corps had, there's a grenade that has colors. They're red and yellow. And an all yellow blade is a good blade. If it's red and yellow, it means it lost its nitrogen charge. On the RH-53s, we had a black and white one, so an all-white blade was good, but if it was black and white, it means you lost pressure in the spar. Now, why this is important, and we also had BIMs inside the cockpit, which the Marine Corps didn't have. Generally, if you got one BIM and the other one never came on, it was generally an electrical problem, but if two came on, chances are there was something bad. <coughs> the Marine Corps had a, RH, or a CH-53 years before this, and 
it came back, it landed at Tustin in Cal near south of Los Angeles in California, and the blade was bad. And the chief said, it's probably just a leaky transducer, pressurized nitrogen, let's go and pressurize it up. Well, the blade is down, and next day they come out, the blade is good. These guys take off, and they come back, the blade is bad. They pressurize it again, aircraft goes out, comes back after mission, and one time it goes out and it doesn't come back. And what had happened, there was a crack on the bottom of the blade, and when the blade hung in its droop position, it closed the crack. And when it would fly, it would open up and let out the nitrogen, and eventually it, the crack propagated and it slung the blade and killed everybody on board. So that's sort of what 53 pots always have in mind is that one incidence that everybody always told you about. So <coughs> we got that blade, so don't worry if it's a single bim, it's electrical, let's keep going. And about 15, 20 minutes later, the light comes on again, and it was BIM channel too. So oh man, we got a problem. So we decided to land in what was considered a dry lake bed, and it wasn't. It was like that mucky, slimy, after a rain type mud. And we sunk up to the belly of the helicopter, and we pulled it over, and we tried it again, and we just sunk up. So we shut the aircraft down, sent our crew chief uh, Buchanan up on top, and sure enough, it was a black and white blade. So we're thinking, like, what do we do? If we go and we come apart, they're going to know we're here. So let's just you know take everything out. And there I am smashing radio heads with, <laughs> with the M16s. Uh, one of the things I didn't know is when I gathered up everyone's M16s, I, I slipped in the mud and hurt my arm, but I jammed around into one of the M16s, which I didn't know about. So Jimmy and Jimmy come down, and they picked us up. They s sunk in the mud, and they said, oh, this ain't good. And they picked over, and they put another footprint over. So now actually what you have is a helicopter and two footprints, plus where the other helicopter is, which comes out later, a news report that came out. So we go ahead and we pick up with them, and we take off. And we're, everything's intense. We're in this habu, they call it. We can't really see straight ahead, but you can see straight down is the only visibility that you had. And they're trying to catch up, so they're going as fast as they could. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a big bang and a flash, and helicopter pitches up and pitches down. And Billy Hoff, being the Marine that he is, decided to make sure all the weapons were empty, and he couldn't unjam that round, so he fired it out the door without telling anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so that scared the bejesus out of everyone on the airplane. Now one time we were flying and all of a sudden the airplane goes nose high. You know, we don't have any seats we're sitting. We're sitting on the floor and also nose low and go up there and you know, what in the world are you guys doing? You know, we almost hit the top of a mountain. Because we were told 500 feet and below, and that's one of the problems with the mission is that everybody played I Got a Secret. The Air Force was told they only had to be 500 feet and below as they entered their airspace, then they go up to 9,000 feet and fly over the stuff and fly all the way in, which would have been nice to know if we would have done that. Um, when we got to Desert One, <coughs> we're the first helicopter there. And when we get there, we could see the road, just like it was in our briefing. There's a burning truck. There's a bus and a bunch of C-130s and a bunch of other C-130s. And we're like, what is going on here? You know, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. And so I don't worry, that's the way it's supposed to be. Don't worry about it. Well, what it was is the truck was a fuel truck that was probably smuggling fuel. And when he came upon all these C-130s, they ordered him to stop. He didn't stop. They shot him with a law missile. He jumped out of the truck, hopped on a motorcycle that was following him, and they took off. The bus happened to be a bunch of Iranian sightseers going to Tabriz, I think it was. And they captured them and said, hey, look, we're not going to hurt you. We're just going to take you away for a while, and we're going to bring you right back. So when they saw that explosion, that had to get them excited, too. <laughs> Excuse me. So we get there, and we land. And like Beckwith's guy saying, where the hell is everybody else? Well, Dash 8, or no, Dash 5 was in there, and he had a dual gyro failure. He said, and he, they turned around, said the airplane was uncontrollable, and turned back around. That was the one with Tr Chuck Pittman in it. They turned around, went back to the carrier, somehow notified the carrier once they got back over water, and the carrier made way, and basically they landed and flamed out because they were basically in the air for eight hours, not so much fuel they had. Um, Colonel Seifert, because the, the weather wasn't like it was brief, no one told us about these things, they went ahead and landed, and when he landed, he only had two other helicopters with him one or two other helicopters, so they're going, oh my God, you know, so they got up and they continued on, so those guys somehow turned around and passed them in flight and never saw them. We get there first, so we passed everybody, so that was interesting, so we land, and one of the other aircraft, uh, I think it was Dash 2, they had a dual hydraulic, or a hydraulic pump failure, second stage hydraulic pump failure, 
and the H53 has a huge accessory pad on it, and it's got three generators and, and uh, three hydraulic pumps. The problem is they're all on the same pad, so a failure of one predicates the failure of the other, which is a land as soon as possible emergency, and we didn't have any other parts, so at that time that aircraft was down. And the way the mission op order was is if you have if you're down three helicopters, you got to turn around and go back and, and hopefully get some other airplane to try it again some other day. So at that time, we decided we were going to go back with Jimmy and Jimmy. We we're going to go back with the boss, Colonel Seaford, because we felt he was a little bit more experienced than Jimmy and Jimmy. And we were standing there, and in our training, I met a fueler, Gunny Lang, and he said to me, if you ever see a blue ball of fire, turn, run the other way, don't let it catch it, it'll burn your clothes off here. <coughs> hey, thanks. So what happened is, the I thought the C-130 was moving ahead. So I get a, I started getting blasted by sand, and everybody was wearing their helmets. We had earplugs in and our helmets, and you had night vision goggles around your neck. And C-130s were all turning. The helicopters uh, shut down to refuel, left their APU on. So it's a lot of noise, a lot of stuff going on. Everybody said it was chaotic. It really wasn't chaotic, but it was just you didn't know really know what was going on. Well. I started getting blasted by sand, and I thought at that time that the C-130 was pulling away. And in reality, what had happened is the H-53 was repositioning to let someone else get that fuel spot, because the C-130s, as Jim Kyle says in his book, the queen of the fleet, didn't want to shut down their engines because you can't take off in a rough terrain takeoff with less than four engines. So he was taking off, and as his story goes, he was getting guided by the guy with the wands, and, and he was following him, and the guy with the wands walked under the wing of the 130, and as he picked up, and again, there's a lot of other, there's been some papers written, but as he picked up, he was probably too heavy to do it because it was 3,000 foot density altitude, 90 degrees at night, he picked up and started losing power, or it's called power settling, and, and the aircraft started settling, and it settled right into the propeller of the C-130, and it cut the 650 gallon ox tank up, and they had their hatch open in the 130, and basically all that fuel went down the hatch, and that's where their five, the five Air Force guys got killed. And the airplane crashed just forward of the wing, and it folded the tail up, so the two crew, the three crew chiefs got trapped in the back. And it was Dewey Johnson, uh, Holmes, and Harvey got killed, the Marines that got killed. And Schaefer uh, was on the right side, and the, his Les's seat pulled up out of the floor, which wasn't uncommon in H-53 crashes. And he thought Les was dead, so he eventually gets out, and he was burned on the left side of his face, had like a big water bubble there when I seen him next. And then he gets out of the airplane, and in the meantime, when the, when the, uh, I thought the C-130 was pulling away, I look, and what I see is a giant blue ball of fire. And I'm thinking, blue ball of fire, turn, run the other way, don't let it catch, I'll burn your clothes off. So I turned and I hauled, but it felt like I ran 100 yards, but I probably only ran about you know, 100 feet and hit the deck and just stayed there for a second, turned around, and what I could see is the C-130 on fire and it was throwing flames off the propellers as they were spinning down. People were running out of the helicopter and I just instinctively ran towards the, the 130 to see if I could help anybody. At that time, things started cooking off of the C-130 and you know, rockets were at glare. I mean, things were flying all over the place. And, the helicopter I was standing next to, all of a sudden those guys jump out the windows of their helicopter because they took a round through their helicopter. I went around the other side of it and boss Colonel Seifert says, you know, John Boy, take care of him. And I thought it was Phil Strickland, an Afri African American officer we had with us, but it wasn't, it was Les Petty, he was burned black. And I got Les on a 130 and uh, John Oldfield, Bernie Oldfield was a uh, major at the time. He said, John Boy, I got him, let me take care of him. And it's funny because as I was carrying less, another guy came, and I didn't know it until years later, was Jim Scaria was the other pilot that was helping Les on there. We finally put our stories together where we were at that night when things happened. And Schaefer came on, and his face was all on the left side because the flames came up through the tunnel and burnt him, and Les was burned real bad. Apparently he got drenched in fuel and got burned bad between the knees and the chest, and he got burned real bad. And at that time we were all in the 130, and people said it was chaotic, but you didn't really know what happened. You just knew there was a fire. I thought the 130 just blew up because of the stuff they were carrying. I, I didn't know there was a helicopter crash at the time. And Schaefer kept saying, it's my fault, it's my fault. I, I killed them all, it's my fault. And it didn't mean anything to me. Now, we're sitting on a 
water bed of fuel. It's like this big black butel rubber water bed. And you know, it's moving around. And here come these Delta guys with these grenade launchers, machine guns and stuff. I'm going, oh man, you blew up your airplane, you're going to blow up ours. Oh man, this is not a good day. So finally, they did some counts and uh, Colonel Wicker was on that airplane. He was an Air Force colonel, you know, trying to count bodies, who was there and who wasn't. And finally, we started taxiing for takeoff. And it was the roughest takeoff you've ever had. I mean, it's like, ba-boom, uh, ba-boom. And finally, we took off. And they said that one of the C-130s broke a wing box going out of there, which is what I'd heard. And that's basically the main structure of one of the wings. But we got out of there. And then what happened is one of the Army guys, the Delta guys, goes to the, the colonel on the airplane and goes, Sir, can we safe and empty our weapons? And he goes, Yeah, go ahead and do that. I'm thinking, Oh, my God, you're going to blow us up for sure. And here's these guys unloading grenade launchers and machine guns and stuff. It was like, you know, it's just so surreal. And you're... we. Like I said, we prayed the airplane off the ground, and finally they came over the uh, PA system on the C-130 and said, gentlemen, we're feet wet, we have CAP, which is a combat air patrol, so that means we had F-14s over the top of us guarding us in. So from there, if I'm not mistaken, we went to Oman, and we landed there, and it took all the hurt guys off, and Les bought that pink T-shirt in Hawaii, and when I cut off his flight suit, all that black stuff had peeled off his face, and as pink as his shirt was, that's how pink his skin was from being burned. And uh, eventually we went out in a hospital ship, a C-141, because they were going to be there for when they got the hostages. If anybody was hurt, they put them on hospital ships and get them out to Ramstein. So from there we went to Watakina, which is in Egypt, and flies and rats are the same all over the world. And they put us in these old Russian MiG hangars, and we're sleeping on these cots, and they gave us beers, but they were warm, so you'd get a big cup of ice, and you'd put the beer in there, and you'd chug the beer down, and get as cold a beer as you want. And at that time, you know, we had our 38s, we had our M16s still, and that night we hear this commotion going on, and I look, and there's Jimmy, and he's freezing, like sitting on the edge of his cot, and his cot is across the entrance of the hangar. I go, Jim, what the hell's going on? And he goes, the Egyptian guards have left us. They're worried about terrorist reprisals. We're on our own. So all of a sudden you start hearing click, clack, click, clack, click, clack. Everybody's loading rounds <laughs> into their M16s. <coughs> Again, no, nobody's really telling you anything, but we didn't know what to expect. So the next day, uh, they debriefed us there, and uh, they went ahead and we had some Iranian money and some American money that you know they took back, and they put us on an airplane, a 141, and they took us to Ramstein Air Force Base, and they briefed us that, guys, as soon as this airplane touches down and stops, you will run right out the right side, and there'll be another 141. You will run right up his tailgate. Don't dilly-dally. Don't hesitate, and worried about terrorist reprisals then. So we ran in there again, last gap to ramp, and that airplane's taken off. And from there, we uh, flew right across the Atlantic and landed at uh, Andrews. And they picked us up in a bunch of vans and took us to Camp Upshore, which is a part of Quantico, Virginia. And again, I, I went through a bottle of bourbon one night, and everybody else did the same thing because it was just this, just this, this thing that didn't work that should have. It was just a very, very depressing time in my life. And uh, I went to go for a run, and of course there's guards at the bottom of the hill. I said, sirs, you can't cross the bridge here. And they were protecting us, but we weren't allowed out. And at that time, we were going to, uh, everybody, all we had is our flight suits and our gear that we had. So they let us go into the Quantico, uh, what do you call it, the uh, PX, to get clothes. Well, everybody else is a normal size. I'm 6'4", and I have 38-inch arms and a 36-inch inseam. Well, BJ got a beautiful heart shaft or Mark suit. These other guys get nice suits. The only thing I could find was a pair of cream colored pants, some tan loafers, and I had a rose colored short sleeve shirt. It's the only thing I could find, you know, along with my underwear and everything. So that's what I had to wear. So we'd go to the Senate Armed Services Committee. They'd drive us to a stairway in Washington, D.C. We'd go down these stairs and you're in these tunnels. And we wind up at Senator Warner's office. And, and before I go there, you know, again, not for the camera, but it's, you know, John Boyd, just remember, don't ask Senator Warner if Liz's boobs are real, you know, and he put it in a little rougher statement of that. So that's the type of humor that was going on during this whole thing. And we went down there basically, you know, debriefed that whole time. While we were at Camp Upshore, we debriefed the whole mission and came up with a, a huge lessons learned plan. And today, the capability that the United States has is phenomenal compared to what we had. And it's all awful, a lot of lessons that we learned. Everybody's got night vision goggle cockpits. Uh, even the H-47s have refueling probes. Uh, the, 
The shooters are great at what they do. You've seen the Bin Laden things. They've got all sorts of super special ops things that were developed from our not being able to complete the mission, but it was the first joint task force put together like that. <coughs> when, you, when you were in route over there for this mission, did you at the time understand that, that you were playing a part in a, a, a historical uh, military operation? Did no, you yeah, register at that time? Or you know, my wife says that. But, you know, when you join them, you've been in the military. When you join the military, you join to do things like that. And one of my things, I'm thinking, John Wayne, jet transition, here I come. And, of course, it didn't work out. But, but you know, that's what you, you join the military for, you know. And like I said, when you first found out what you're doing, you're thinking, like, oh, my God, we're going to die. But once you get that buzz going, like Hannibal says on the A-team, you know, oh, Hannibal's got, the, he's on the jazz. And, and really, you, you get sucked into this machine that you just do exactly what you're supposed to do, and you train hard, and you stay in shape, and you, know, you do what you're supposed to do. Um, without getting too political, any thoughts about what's going on right now with Iran and the, the issues that we're having? You know, yes, I do. The way we can solve our world problems is two ways. Number one, only 20% of the Senate and Congress have ever been in the military. Let's make 50% of the Senate and Congress be in the military on the front in any combat they decide to do. So if you had a senator and a congressman and his children, if we had the draft, that were going to go to Iraq or Afghanistan or Somalia or wherever it is, I think they'd be a little hesitant on doing that. The other one is everything's about money, everything's about oil. If we can get to a pure solar and wind economy in the United States, we don't need them. There's big money that's forcing all this. And Eisen, President Eisenhower said it, you have to beware of the military industrial complex. It will destroy this nation. And that's what it's doing. So um, you're retired from the military now. You're, you're I had eight years active and then the rest in the Navy Reserves. So if a young man, <coughs> young man comes up to you uh, today out here at World War II weekend and says, hey, you know, I heard you're in the military. I'm thinking about enlisting or becoming commissioned. What advice would you give him? I, I think the military is a great place to start. I, like I said, is it teaches you. You can tell a military guy. When I see you, I can see that you've been in the military. When you go to a, a store and a salesman's there, you can tell that guy's been a Marine or that, that guy's been in the military just by the way he presents himself. Uh, he is the first one to run towards a problem rather than away from a problem. I think the military is a great place to start. And for kids, if you don't have a way to pay for education, the military will pay for your education. I earned my master's degree was at Whiting Field as a flight instructor. I'd fly from 5 in the morning till three in the afternoon and go to school from four to eight, two nights a week, and earned a master's degree that way. And, they, and the VA paid for it. So I think it's a great deal. This, uh, <coughs> this DVD, is we're going to give you a copy, and um, eventually your great, great, great grandkids might stumble upon it. What would you want them to know about your military service? I, you know, things, that, like I said, my goal was to be an astronaut. Uh, things you've learned is that and it doesn't always work. As you know, my goal, my degree is in mechanical engineering. I have a master's in management, but I was a helicopter pilot, and my last name is Dychek, a Ukrainian Russian name. And when you look at the general boards or the flag boards, there's not many Eastern European names there. There's Smith and Jones and Pattons and Eisenhowers. You know, it's a very waspish organization when you think about it. You know, think about it. When you look at that admiral's board or the flag boards, there's not many differentiations in last names there. Uh, I, I went ahead and I thought I could do everything and I applied for the space program multiple times, didn't have enough flight time. They, I should have gotten a master's degree, but one of my flight students, who was a great guy, uh, he's a captain for Delta now, he, uh, he went ahead and came to me and he had a master's degree in aeronautical engineering good looking guy. Steve Overbeck was his name. Great guy. He said, John, I want to do this. Said, well, let me tell you what you got to do. I said, Steve, you need to stay here as an instructor, get as much flight time as you can. And that way, when you finish flying your P3s, you'll have so much flight time. Plus, you've got your master's degree in, in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech. You'll be, able, you'll be a prime candidate. <clears throat> you got to get to test pod school. Well, I met Steve years later, and he was out of the damn Navy. And what had happened was, is the trick is, is like six months prior to you getting your 
an assignment to go to test pilot school, you apply to test pilot school maybe a year prior or six months prior, so they get to know you, they get to know your application. Well, Steve did that, and his commanding officer flew off the handle and said, why are you trying to get out of my squadron so early? And Steve says, I'm not trying to do that, sir. I'm just trying to get these guys to know me. And he basically hammered him on his fitness report, and Steve got out and he was flying for Delta. So even though I would have loved to have done that, I mean, Steve couldn't get there. Another friend of mine who was killed in a helicopter crash, he was an alternate for the space program. And, you know, then the, the Challenger happened, and some of these guys that have trained to be an astronaut have never gotten to be there. And I was a captain for American Airlines. I'm probably closer to that than I've ever been. Would I, if I won the lottery, would I love to go up in the space shuttle? You bet, in a heartbeat. So would you, you know? Anything else you want to document about your uh, time um, on this important mission? No, I, I just think that people need to read. They need to see the, the World War II movies. They need to see the Vietnam movies. Uh, uh, I think, it's, I forgot what his name was. The movie uh, We Were Soldiers, with, where Mel Gibson played, we met the um, embedded reporter. And he actually broke down in tears telling his story. And he said that that movie, We Were Soldiers and Hamburger Hill, are 85% accurate of the Vietnam War. And people forget about stuff. People have already forgotten about 9-11. You know, like you said, you talked about guys getting on the airplane. You know, by goodness, you know, the Israelis, they handle their security mighty, you know, they have a guy with a news <laughs> on the airplane. They follow their airplanes out to the end of the runway. You know, we, we forget about that. But with freedom comes a lot of other problems. But we are a free country, and as fouled up as you may think this country is, it's still the best country in the world to live at. So, you know, that's some of the problems. I think we have a judicial system that's broken. Uh, senators and congressmen are making money. You know, they just, I think it was two years ago, the Supreme Court passed a law that said that they couldn't do insider trading. But up to then, they were doing this insider trading when they had this information. But yet, they'll put Martha Stewart in jail. You, you know, why do you do that when you're not putting your senators and congressmen in jail for doing stuff like that? But I think that if you had 50% of former military guys in your Senate and congressmen, people would think a lot differently before they get into conflicts. You know, you, like I said, you're in the military and you're a pawn in a great big chessboard. Now, when he decides you're going to go, you're going to go. But if he had to go, he might think twice. Well, I cannot thank you enough for spending the time with us today, and um, it's an incredible honor to meet you and hear you. Well, I'd like to thank you. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I didn't plan on doing this. Uh, for a good friend of mine died, World War II Wildcat pilot, and that's why I'm here. Well, we appreciate it. Thanks, John. Hey, thanks.